All right, let's begin. Open up your Bibles to Genesis 9, and then we're going to go through a lot of genealogy today. Now, if you want to know word for word, I'm going to give you good advice today. If you want to know word for word in the Bible, especially when we come to genealogies, you're going to have to prepare to write a lot, okay? Because I'm, I'm, I'm not going to really take time and slow down in each and every name. So what I would advise is, is either in your Bible, or if you're good at writing fast, just simply write down the name and then put like an equal symbol and then put in the country name, all right? Sometimes I might give the Hebrew or the etymological roots behind each name. So you can put that in too, all right? So I'm just giving you guys a heads up because we're going to be covering a lot of names in genealogy. But before we cover genealogy, let's wrap up Noah. All right, Genesis chapter 9. All right, hopefully the mic's working. Let me know if it doesn't work at all, okay? And that uh, audio video is recording too. So, all right. All right, Genesis chapter 9. And then we left off at verse 20, um, let's see right here, 28. Okay, Genesis chapter 9, verse 28. So remember, we went through 25 through 27 about the three sons and then Canaan becoming the servant, and then 28. Noah lived after the flood 350 years. So after that's self-explanatory. After the flood that Noah went through, Noah was able to continue living for 350 years. So he was here in his tent, living happily, except that one crazy incident yeah. with his son that you know about, all right? So he lived about 350 years. Besides this incident, he lived a happy life. And I forgot to erase this part. Oh, my goodness. All right. So he lived about 350 years, okay, happily, uh, besides this incident with the wine that he did. Verse 29, and all the days of Noah were 950 years. So in total, though, uh, 350 years after the flood, he was able to live peacefully, and then total, though, all the days that he lived was about 950 years, and he died. So just like Genesis chapter 5, it's the same uh, wording right there. Now we come to chapter 10, verse 1. Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah. So now that we finished the life of Noah, now we're coming across... Uh, the generations and everybody who passed along from Noah. All right. The generations that follow Noah's sons are followed. Shem and Ham and Japheth. So obviously three, Noah's, uh, three of Noah's sons are named Shem, Ham, Japheth. And these are their generations, his sons. And unto them were sons born after the flood. So that's self-explanatory. From these three men, there were sons born after the flood. So now we first come across Japheth. Okay, so then Japheth's son. And then as I taught you in uh, Sociology 101, they do agree that there were basically three main uh, ethnicities from the genetic stream that were spread out. So that matches with your Bible. And back then they termed it. Now I don't know what they call it anymore because they keep changing terms. But back then they called it... Uh, Caucasian, and then black, and then uh, mongoloid back then. So then Japheth is the first one that we're going to cover. So Japheth, here are his sons. And what I'm going to be doing now is uh, reading you from Dr. Uckman's commentary. It's his book of Genesis. It's, called, it's the book of Genesis, and the author is Peter S. Ruckman. And I'm going to be mostly reading his stuff. So when his sons start to go out and conquer and uh, live the lands for themselves, Dr. Upman has it down here at page 263 of his Genesis commentary. He makes it exciting as follow. The day when Noah and his family started down through the snowdrifts on Ararat, old man Noah said, there she is, boys, help yourselves. Get you a grub steak at any place you can find it. Ham, there's a tiny little stretch of land down south there, about four million acres. Give or take a few million. Stake her out and get you some mineral rights and a clear title deed. 
Japheth, that's yours up to the north and northwest. The whole Ponderosa is yours, son. Fence in the spread and divide it up with our grandchildren. Each one can take about 300,000 acres. Give or take a few thousand. Shem, all that out there east and southeast is yours. Cut you out a little homestead, a few thousand acres. The lot runs 7,000 miles by 3,000 miles. Take about 400 acres for the house, 20,000 acres for the backyard, 50,000 acres for the pasture, 100,000 acres for growing a garden, and then split the 7 million acres up between your children. So that's how he wrote it as in his southern accent. Now that they go out and get the lands for themselves, how did they live up to their lands? So here we go with the sons of Japheth. Now this is on page 264. In your Bible it says, this, uh, in verse 2, the sons of Japheth, Gomer. So that's the first one is Gomer. So who is Gomer? So let's write down his children here. All right, this is going to be a lot to cover. All right, here we go. Gomer is basically uh, the Cimmerians, and this is based off of Herodotus' writings, Cimmerians, Cimmerians of Homer, and this is found at Odysseus' chapter 11, uh, from 13 through 19. The Cimmeri of North Germany and the Cimmeri of Wales come from Gomer. In their early migrations, they are found south of the Black Sea. From thence, they move up through Bulgaria and Romania into Hungary and Czechoslovakia. They are the Saxons, Frisians, Celts, Picts, Jutes, Angles, Gauls, and Franks of medieval Europe. Now, Gomer in Hebrew means completion, completion. There's another passage that mentions about Gomer, and that's Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 6. Ezekiel, you can turn over there. I'm going to read it very quickly. We're not going to spend too much time there, but Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 6. When I quote passages, uh, I would suggest to write them down because we're not going to really turn over there. All right, the Bible says, Gomer and all his bands, the house of Tagarma of the north quarters, and all his bands and many people with thee. So this is where Gomer is mentioned. All right. Now, he's going to be involved with the War of Gog and Magog uh, during the time of the end of the millennium. But that's a different story. So that will be uh, when I give a commentary on Ezekiel. So we're not going to spend time on that one. We just want to know where, uh, who Gomer is. That's the point of Ch Genesis chapter 10, to know who they are, what's their background. All right, two is Magog. All right, that's another famous one from Ezekiel 38 as well. So Magog is involved with that war at the end of the millennium. All right, in Genesis chapter 10, notice the next name mentioned is uh, Gomer and Magog. Magog is, uh, Dr. Upman says here, probably Scythian mountaineers who remain in the Black Sea area after Gomer families leaves. So Magog is next. The word comes from a Hebrew root meaning to dread or to fear. So that's what his name means, to dread or to fear. But no Hebrew root can be found for the Gog part of the word. The Turks who fought against the Crusaders come from this group partially, although many of Magog's descendants moved further north and settled in the Ukraine. Well, that's who they are. Madai, all right, in Genesis chapter 10 and verse 2, and Madai. All right, they are Kurdish tribes east of Assyria, all right? There we go. I'm going to write a lot of names today. And they settled the southwest shore of the Caspian Sea and migrated to new frontiers on the Don and Volga River. Now, that name, Madai, means middle. It means middle. All right, Javan. So notice in Genesis chapter 10, verse 2, and Javan. Javan, uh, Dr. Rutman writes over here. Let's continue on. This man is undoubtedly the progenitor of the Ionians, which is, if you remember your intermediate discipleship class, the early Greeks 
They were very ancient early Grecians that time. And his descendants gravitate west from Ararat and settle western Turkey, Thrace, and Macedonia. The word Javan in Hebrew means bubbling up or fermenting. So that's what Javan means. So basically he, his name means kimchi. All right. So the next, next one at Genesis chapter... <laughs> Well, <laughs> you'll find out later for lunch. All right. Uh, the next one at uh, verse 2, and Tubal, and Tubal. All right. So uh, that's the next part that we come across is uh, Tubal's name. Now, uh, Dr. Upman, I don't think he uh, writes m uh, much except later on. But let's go to Genesis chapter 10, verse 4. All right. So we'll go back there. All right. Let's go to Genesis chapter 10, verse 4. And the sons of Javan. All right. So Dr. Ruckman writes here, the sons of Javan. One is uh, Elisha. Now, in Egyptian, Elysia. And basically, he's from Sicily, kin to the Greek Ionians. Okay. So that's where Elisha is located. So these are the sons of Javan. Uh, let's see here. And Tarshish. Tarshish, the... T Tirseni of Western Italy, and those of Tartessus in Spain. Okay, so Javan's children would be as follows. Here we go. Let's write this down here. Elisha, and then Tarshish. Next ones are uh, Kittim. Kittim. Dr. Upman writes here plainly, uh, the inhabitants of Cyprus. Uh, Chittim. That's another way to do it. And basically, they established colonies on the east coast of Italy and the west coast of Greece. Uh, Numbers 24, 24 is an example where you're going to see Kittim mentioned. Numbers 24, 24. In Hebrew, his name means to hide away. It also means to soil or to stain. All right? So that's what kitta means, okay? The next one is dodanim. So, and dodanim in verse 4. Dodanim, the word is supposedly a slip of the pen in the King James Bible. That's what the modern Bible version scholars will claim. So they're going to say that it's not dodanim. It should be a different name. And they're going to say it's Rodenim for Rhodes, because they're thinking about Rhodes, R-H-O-D-E-S. But uh, in First Chronicles uh, chapter 1 and verse 7, if you, uh, the King James Bible in First Chronicles chapter 1 verse 7, they will mention that it's Dodenim. Now, Dr. Uckman argues as follows. Now, basically, the Hebrew scholar's argument, what they're based on the following, is based on uh, their Hebrew language. They like to use the Samaritan Pentateuch, or the LXX, uh, for their proof text. But uh, no, uh, they're mistaken. Dr. Uckman writes here, it's actually referring to the Dardanians, or Trojans of Greece and Donians of South Italy. The word in Hebrew is kin to love or beloved. So the Hebrew word is close to the meaning of love or beloved. So in other words, it's not referring to Rhodes, it's referring to a different group of people. It's the Trojans of Greece or the Donians of South Italy. So that's where they get the mistake over there. Now let's go back to Genesis chapter 10. And then verse 2. So we've seen the sons of Javan. Now we continue on with uh, Tubal. So notice uh, in verse 2, and Tubal. Dr. Uckman's right, uh, Dr. Uckman writes as follows. Let's see right here. Let me write his name. Identified by the Schofield Board of Editors in 1901 as having a connection with Tobolsk. And he mentions here, the word means profane or uh, pro, pro, uh, profanation. So that his word, means, his word means to profane. It's kin to, 
<coughs> excuse me, the habitable globe. So he inhabits the globe. That's what his name could mean. So his name could be a hidden meaning for something scientific in the Bible. Who knows? Now, it's identified by Josephus, Noble, and Langi as the inhabitants of Armenia, Tibaranese and Iberians who settled in modern Turkey and migrated up through the Caucasus as did the sons of Madai and Magog. So that's what Tubal is referring to. Now, uh, Meshach is the next person. Meshach. Let's see here. All right. Dr. Ruckman rec recommends that uh, if you look at the Schofield Reference Bible, and the Schofield Reference Bible refers to Meshach for Moscow, as for Moscow, and that uh, his sons and grandsons, uh, oh, basically his name means the old one, the old one. That's what his name means. His sons and grandsons are the Moshi of northern Armenia and Asia Minor. Now, there's a Hebrew uh, meaning behind this, okay? The, oh, excuse me, I messed up, okay? It, his name does not mean the old one, okay? Dr. Upman meant the old Schofield Reference Bible. Okay, so I'm sorry. All right, I totally messed that up. All right. The Hebrew meaning for Meshach is oil or mixture. His name means oil or mixture. The next one in your King James Bible, Antirus, Antirus. All right, so let's see what his name means right here. The inhabitants of Thracia come from Tyrus, and this is based off of Josephus. That was his source. Uh, and they migrate to the Taurus Mountains. The word is kin to severe or austere. All right, severe or austere. By the time you know all these names, you can start using them for your vocabulary words, you know. Mm -hmm. Scare your children, you know. Scare your children. I am a tyrus, all right? You didn't chit him your pants, right? So something like that. So. <laughs> all right, so anyways, uh, let's go to Genesis chapter 10 and verse 3. Genesis chapter 10 and verse 3. And the sons of Gomer. So now we're going to uh, cover Gomer's children. So Gomer's children are as follows. Notice right here, Ashkenaz. So that's uh, Gomer's, from Gomer's line. So let's put Gomer's line here now. Uh, now, here's something interesting. This is where you get uh, Ashkenazi Jews. And basically, some people might say that uh, then the Jews are not Shemites, but that's not true because in Shem's line, he mentions Peleg. And when you compare that with Chronicles, there's no doubt about it. When you compare it with Chronicles over there, then it's uh, uh, Peleg's line from Shem mentions Jesus' descendants, the Jews' descendants. So then uh, you got to realize this. There's not just uh, one uh, type of Jews you got to understand. There's, um, I think, Sephardic Jews and then Ashkenazi Jews and a lot of different Jews. So you have to understand that uh, Ashkenazi Jews is just one of them. Why? Because Jews were wandering people for over a millennia, for nearly two millennia, actually. So because of that, they were mingling with a lot of groups of people. All right. Let's continue on. So uh, let's see here. When Ashkenaz... Dr. Ottman says, which is interesting, which is where the Jews may have come from, because remember the Holocaust, it was mostly centered in Germany, and a lot, millions of Jews were slaughtered there. So, it's Ashkenaz, Dr. Ottman says, is modern Germany. And this is according to Jewish commentator and exegetes. So in Jewish writings, they will mention that. It's referring to modern Germany. Other writers locate his descendants much further southwest, so it could be a different region, near Bithynia and Phrygia in Asia Minor, which is now Turkey. So it could be either or. It could be modern Germany or Turkey. All right, the next person, Riphath, and Riphath. 
Rifath, Dr. Upman says, these are the Slavs, Bulgars, Lombards, and Croatians of the Middle Ages. Uh, who leave the west slope of Ararat in 2300 BC, migrate through northern Turkey in 2200, and go up and over the Carpathian Mountains into the Balkans around 2000 BC. They are all over Eastern Europe before Nebuchadnezzar knows a hanging garden from a potted plant at 606 BC. Right, that sounds like Dr. Upton's writing. Okay. All right, the next person, uh, notice in your Bible, and Togarma, Togarma. Togarma presumed to be the progenitor of a race of people in northern Armenia. Near the Moshi by the Caspian Sea. The Crimea, is their, the Crimea is their main abode and migrations to the east mingle their blood with that of Shem's descendants. Now, I taught this in intermediate discipleship class, but what you're going to find out is as all these people are migrating and spreading out, I mean, they spread out throughout all the lands, but remember, uh, their populations uh, multiply and they keep migrating. So eventually, Shem, Ham, and Japheth are going to bump across each other. So then ever since the early BCs, intermingling is inevitable that time. Why? Because they migrate, population increase, they're going to bump into each other, and there's going to be intermingling. So this was uh, even before Abraham's timeline, this was going on. So there was intermingling going on. Now, in Genesis chapter 10, uh, I'm going to talk about this interesting thing concerning about the intermingling as well as the spreading out as commanded by God, which is why God raised up Abraham. And I kind of taught that in intermediate discipleship class. But I'll tell you about that pretty soon. Let me go to chapter 10, verse 5 now, all right? So we read chapter 10, verse 2, verse 3, Gomer's children, Javan's children. All right, now we're in verse 5, all right? By these, so Japheth's children, were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands. So then the islands, so the isles are referring to obviously islands. Notice of Japheth's lines is called Gentiles. And notice the Bible says they were divided in their lands. So they all went to their own land. They were divided as they were spread out. Everyone after his tongue. So each of these people who spread out in their divisions... They were in their own language and tongue after their families. They went after their uh, family line in their nations, in their own nation that they inhabited. Now, there are several uh, notes over here to interestingly see. First is referring to the isles. What are the isles? Dr. Ruckman says, if you want to write it down, but it's gonna, I'm going to quote it fast, is plainly a reference to Corsica, Sardinia, Sicily, I think it's Majorca or Majorca, uh, Crete, Cyprus, Rhodes, and the offshore islands of the Greek archipelago. Eventually, the term includes England and Ireland. So England and Ireland could eventually be inclusive. So this is all referring to Japheth's line. All right, so this is the Caucasians over here. Another thing to notice, which is interesting at verse 5, is that Japheth is known as Gentiles. Did you notice that right there? So basically, white people can be known as Gentiles, which is very, very interesting. Now remember, if you read the New Testament all over, when Jesus was contrasting the Jews and Gentiles, the Gentiles, if you know, that was referring to mostly Japheth's line. It could refer to some of the other Semites or the other Hamites, but mainly that was referring to Japhethites. Why? Because the New Testament was written in Greek, right. and then the Greeks were the ones that was mainly spread out, and the Romans too. Right. So they come from Japheth's line. So Gentiles were referring to them. So if you think that Christianity is a white supremacist Bible, you're dead wrong. You know what the Bible talks about the Gentiles, right? Yeah, dogs. All right. And that was from a white man, by the way, who just said that. So, so the thing is this. See, I'm not stereotyping right here. So 
you have to understand that this book is not a white supremacist book. Actually, it condemns a lot about the white people over here. Right. Calls them dogs. And then it mentions about a uh, certain uh, inhabitant in the island of Crete that they were lazy and stuff like that. It's a completely racist book over there against white people. So I'm very sorry about that. So you notice right here, the point is this. Like I mentioned in our previous Genesis study, what God is, is that uh, God, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't care about race or individuality. If he's going to talk bad about your race or an individual, he's going to do it. If he's going to talk nice about your race or an individual, he'll do it. And he did it with everybody. All right, so that's the bottom line. To avoid any stereo, uh, negative reference that God puts on a nation or an individual in the Bible, you're just avoiding what God, uh, what God condemned about an individual. And now we're at a point now that the Bible never says anything bad about you. See, that's the point. That's why I don't like it. So I don't shy away, whether it's controversial or not. Point is, if the Bible says so, say it, man. Splatter all over my name and my race. I don't care. I know what I am. I'm worse than what the Bible says. All right. So whatever bad thing the Bible says about me, I mean, God's being very merciful. Okay, then. Good. I got an amen on that way. It looks like all of you know how much a bunch of dirty, rotten scumbags you all are. All right. Good. All right. You're in the right church. All right. What a great positive message that encouraged your morning. All right. Don't you all feel better right now? All right. Now, here's a, another thing here. Now that we talked about uh, some stereotypical stuff. Might as well get into this one now because this is where it covers. Now, this is very important. Remember this. Now, I'm going to come across these group of people later here, Nimrod and his Tower of Babel. This is going to be very important to note. When God gave the blessing to Noah and his sons, this is very important, Genesis chapter 9, and then we saw at, uh, let's see here, What's the best verse to start? Well, a good verse is at verse 1, right? Genesis chapter 10, verse 1. The sons were spreading out, right? They were growing. Why? Because they were following God's covenant here so that they should spread out. Look at verse uh, 19, verse 19 of chapter 9. Chapter 9 and verse 19. These are the three sons of Noah, and of them was a whole earth, what? Overspread. Okay, so that's important to understand. Let me show you the basis here through Scripture. All right, these sons, okay, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, they were spreading out, right? Uh, I want to make a line for uh, Ham's nation later. Ah, I'll just write here. Spread. So they were spreading out, right? Now, a lot of people don't understand what the meaning is right here. When they were spreading out, what did they take that to mean? I'll tell you what they took that to mean. Look at chapter 10 and verse 5. By these were the isles of the Gentiles, what? Divided in their lands. Look at this. Everyone after his tongue, after their families, in their what? Nations. Now notice when they were spreading out, this was supposed to mean division. Now, your God is a God of division, you're going to notice right there, throughout your Bible. It's inevitable. That's why we have dispensationalism, rightly dividing. That's God's tendency. Now, look at over here. A good example is Acts 7. Uh, go to Acts 17. Acts 17. Acts 17. Now, notice, why did God divide people into their own lands, into their own portions? Simple. I'll show you one person who didn't do that later on. And this one person didn't do that, which is why God wasn't happy. All right, but we'll come to that later. And then what did he do? He spread them out. He divided and spread them out. But anyway, let's go to Acts 17. And I want you to go to Genesis 11. All right, that way we could compare Scripture with Scripture and see God's intention when he gave that covenant uh, to Noah and to his sons for them to spread out. All right, look at Acts 17, and I want you to go to Genesis chapter 11. Now, notice right here, now this is biological and scientific, which is amazing. I think it was Time magazine 
They pointed out that all of us came from one ancestry, which is amazing. So then it showed Adam and Eve, obviously. Well, the Bible predicted that. It was so obvious. The Bible showed that we all came from uh, one blood that was from Adam. But then he pointed out that from this one blood, God put them in their own divided lands and portions where they can be happy. Let's look at Acts chapter 17. And then notice right here at verse 26, 26. And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. So that's from, obviously, we can see from Noah, right? And then from Adam. And then uh, his three sons all spread out. But notice right here, and hath determined the times before appointed. So God's the one that determined this. All right? God's the one that determined this. The what? Bounds of their habitation. Look at this that they should seek the Lord if they haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. Now think about this. When did God, think about this, when did God determine to put them in their boundaries when they spread out throughout all the earth? So it shows right here God's original intention was for everyone to be in their divided portions and land. You might say, why? Well, let's go to Genesis 11. This was why. Look at Genesis chapter 11. What if they all stayed together in their one place rather than divided in their portions, in their land? God don't like that. Why is that? Because you know what you're capable of. Just look at today. Look at today's day and age. You know what you're capable of when mankind unites without God. Look at Genesis chapter 11, verse 1. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. Well, that sounds nice. And it came to pass as a journey from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. Well, that sounds nice. They didn't go divided in their own lands. Let's all stay together. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them throughly. Verse 4, And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top, may reach unto heaven. Isn't that something that Lucifer said on Isaiah 14? Yeah. And let us make us a name. Isn't that what Lucifer kind of said at Isaiah 14? Lest we be what? Scattered abroad. See, they don't want to be scattered. God don't like that. What's the evidence? Verse 6, see that? God don't like that. He wants them to scatter to go in their divisions. Verse 6, And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one. See, he sees that, that, uh, un un uh, that unity of the people. And they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them. See that? God don't like that, where they're persuaded they're going to stay together. Now look at the language of verse 6, which they have what? Imagine to do. Isn't that, wait a minute, uh, uh, deja vu, Genesis 6, they went by what? The imagination of their heart. See, God don't like that. Right. You might say, why is that? So what God knows is this, is that when you're without God, when you're without Jesus Christ and you're left alone as you are to spread about, build your civilization, God knows what humanity is capable yeah. of without God. That's why it's called humanism. So when humankind is left to their own devices, God knows what's best. You scatter, spread out throughout all the world, and stay in your divisions. Why? Because when you all come together, you know what the birth is? I don't know if you knew some of this stuff. One easy example is the Antichrist kingdom, the New World Order. That's the easiest example. Second example, uh, the second example is where we get contemporary music. You know how contemporary music was born? When we mixed up Japheth seed and then ham seed of music together. Uh, rock, rap, and all you get those heavy beats was birthed from jazz. Jazz is the mother. I studied jazz from a person who had roots in New Orleans, a black person, professional musician. He had ties with uh, Disney musicians as well, this guy. I studied him in uh, Los Angeles, actually. So jazz is the mother and birth of all what you get with the heavy metal rock and the satanic music of today. Why? Because of that intermingling. 
where Hamseed and Japheth's music combine together. That's where you get the birth of a lot of uh, messed up teachings. You know how you get this cultural sensitivity with uh, sexual orientation sensitivity? You know where all that came from? I'll tell you where all that came from. When, uh, and then the respect and tolerance of different religions. You know where all that came from? When all of human, humanity united. When humanity united, they felt like Western education was taking a dominance. So we have to be more inclusive of the Eastern ideologies now, they'll call it. So they'll include this Hinduism stuff, Buddhist stuff, Eastern cultural stuff. And then they include all the minority stuff. And they'll include that in their languages. So uh, it's so funny is that uh, when I took English class, they know Shakespearean language is a genuineness and the height, the best of the English language. And then when they cover Ebonics, so I covered Ebonics at English class. That was pretty fun. I wrote Ebonics too. I read a book on Ebonics actually. So it took, uh, I don't know what was uh, harder, that one or Chaucer's Tales, Old English. I don't know which one was harder. Yeah, but I had fun with both. I had fun with both. But anyway, the point is this. The point is, is that because it's Berkeley, they know that Ebonics, that this is not the richness of the English language, and they'll say that. But because they don't want to offend the cultural minorities, they said, but there's a beauty behind it with abbreviated words, and then it's easier to talk and all that kind of stuff. So I wrote a whole paper on Ebonics, you know, on how it could benefit the English language. I know all that kind of stuff. So I studied, uh, I studied all this. Why do they do that? The reason why is because see what the world's doing? This is what happens. This is 2021. You know why you're complaining, whining, and upset with today's civilization right now? I'll tell you why. All this hum humanism uniting. If humanism was divided, and then we'd be all right. Now, here's the thing. Look at Acts 17. Look at Acts 17. So then, does that mean then that our church have their divided classes? That's not what it means. Because there's only one unity God allows, which is what the world does not allow. The unity is this. When it comes to Shem, Ham, and Japheth, in their own spreading out their humanity, their human inhabitants, God wants them divided, spread out, stay in their lanes and their boundaries, basically segregated. But with the integration and unity, God only allows one. And that's not based on humanity. It's based on deity. See that? So based on deity, based on God, he sees no differences and then he sees the unity. If you look at Acts chapter 17, verse 27, God wanted them to happily seek after him when he spread them all out. Okay, that's why God allowed Romans 2, where the salvation was by their conscience. Amen. That's why God allowed that. But then what happened right here at verse 30, it changed in the New Testament. Look at verse 30. Verse 30, and the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now what? Commandeth all men everywhere to repent. So what God wants this time is universally, not where they're segregated in their own lanes. Universally, he wants them all come unto repentance. And then when you come unto repentance, you know what happens. Look at 1 Corinthians 10. No, not 1 Corinthians. Yeah, do, do 1 Corinthians 10. Go to 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians 10. What happens when you repent and receive salvation, the Lord Jesus Christ, God don't look at your human ethnicity anymore. He looks at you spiritually. Yeah. So he doesn't see Jew, Gentile, Japheth, Shem, Ham. What he sees is basically his child, yeah. his son. There's only one color he sees, and that's not black, white, or yellow. That's actually red. That's the red blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Notice that the Bible reads over here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that he only sees the division as basically as follows at verse 32, verse 32. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the who? Church of, church of God. Now notice that church of God, I mean, are you part of the church? Yes. Yeah. Notice that, 
if no matter what nationality, ethnicity you are, you're all considered the church. But then if you're a humanist, see, if you're secular, God sees the division. Yeah. Jew, Gentile, 32. That's important to understand. So basically, our uh, government, school, and uh, world system, if they're going to have a secular... Look, I'm not telling them to combine church and state and be completely religious where there's a pope in power taking over. I'm not telling you to do that. There is a secular thing in place, a humanism thing in place. But guess what? You all got to be divided on that one. Why? Because God knows what you're capable of. God knows what you're all capable of. You see this socialism, communism thing? What is it? It's unity right here. So that one guy can control all the pot. Capitalism has its flaws. Segregation with the different nation has its flaws. There is wars against each other. There is uh, racism and hatred and etc. But you know why that's a better position? Because with capitalism and those divisions, you stay in your lane and there's a competition. And then the economy thrives and gets better. The society strives to become better and compete and etc. Now they have their flaws and their problems. That every system, one thing you learn is this, every humanist secular system has problems. But God sees the best option right here is the division option, the capitalism option. God sees that as the best option for humanism. But if you look, if you put God in the picture, then God don't see the divisions. And you'll be all right, no matter what. Whether you're in a socialist country or a capitalist country, guess what, church? You'll be all right if you got God. Amen. So why don't you get saved in the Lord Jesus Christ? No, you're too prideful to do that. So God knows that. So when he starts Shem, Ham, and Japheth, he knows that not everyone's going to get saved. So you all stay divided. Wow. That's the best for y'all. All right, 1 Corinthians 12. Yeah, you're not going to hear teaching like this. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. I do believe in segregation, not integration, when we talk about a humanist perspective. I am all 1,000% for that one. When I'm talking about an integrated unity perspective, I'm only going to base it off of one, and that's on Jesus Christ and His Word. And that's why we as a church, we're rich with uh, uh, many diverse background, ethnicities, characters, personalities. That's the beauty of our church. Why? Because we find a unity somewhere. And that's not on our sexual orientation or our religious uh, doctrines where we can be non-denominational. See, they're integrated, those bunch. So we can set aside different doctrines. No, we believe in one common ground. That's Jesus Christ and his word. So we get right doctrine, right thinking, right spirituality, right practices. That's where differences can be tolerated based on this one. When you have that, when you have that ground zero and gone, guess what? You're best all separated, divided, and alone, and you all should be segregated. Why? Because when, all, when I get a thousand devils combining together, that's dangerous. Best they all stay in their own lanes. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. God don't see a difference. You're all united, and that's only based spiritually. So remember that. All right, let's go back. Let's go back. All right, let's go back to Genesis chapter 10. Genesis chapter 10. So I know of people who might, uh, for example, they might have some cultural differences and then uh, missionaries who marry a different ethnicity. And then there are those, uh, if, when we come, listen up, this is important. When you come from a humanist cultural perspective, those differences are hard to get along and you will fight. And that's why America has over 50% of divorce. But when you got those people as say believers, and I know what I'm talking about right here, okay? Because, uh, might as well say it, all right? So, uh, so, you know, being married at myself, I married a Korean, but guess what? There's still a huge gap right here in differences. Why? Because I uh, lived in the American environment. My wife lived in a Korean environment. 
So then how is it that these uh, differences can get along? Only one thing me and wi my wife get along because we believe in Jesus Christ. So we're humble enough to take, to see where we're wrong at based on the word of God, sacrifice for each other to maintain the relationship. You don't see that in this country right here. They all go by a humanist, secular perspective on what to tolerate and what to get along. But guess what? If you have no standard right here, how can you get along? When you have no standard right here. See that? All right. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 10. Genesis chapter 10. And then uh, we'll read verse 6. Verse 6. All right. The most interesting nationality to look up is Ham right here. Verse 6, and the sons of Ham. So now we cover Ham's children. All right, so let's come to Dr. Altman's commentary uh, right here. Let's see, Ham. All right, so Ham. So in Hebrew, uh, his name, Ham, means burnt or heat. That's what Ham means. It means burnt. Ah, let me, this won't pop. His name means uh, burnt or heat. And then from Cush, here we go. Let's cover their names. Cush, the modern Hebrew word for it is basically uh, Ethiopia. And it actually even means black as well. It means black for Cush. The modern Hebrew word for Ethiopia. As a matter of fact, if you look up the history of Ethiopia, they called themselves Cush back then. Believe it or not, they called themselves Cush. So interesting. Uh, you're going to find out Cush, he begat one of the most wicked people ever in the universe, Nimrod. But it's so amazing that from that line, the Lord gave the first New Testament saved Christian as well. It's interesting. It's like the Lord you know, paying back the devil or something. All right. And anyways, uh, I digress. Let's go back here. Uh, we come to the next one. Uh, verse 6, Cush and Mizraim. All right, Mizraim. The modern word for actually Egypt. Uh, Hebrew, uh, the Hebrew root actually means distress. Distress. Now, in your Bible... Egypt is uh, very negatively portrayed, very negatively portrayed in your Bible. So you want to avoid Egypt at all costs, and we're going to see that later on in the Bible. All right, next one is foot, foot. Uh, let's see right here, and foot. Dr. Upman says here, identified by every writer in every age, Jacinius, Josephus, and Kalish, included as fet or foot. Fiat. So that's how, what those sources describe foot as. And they are the Libyans west of Egypt, for some of you who didn't know. They are referring to the Libyans west of Egypt. Foot, his name means bow. His name means bow. Now it is so interesting right here that just on these uh, three up to four sons of all of Cush, right over here, we see the types of the Antichrist already. You might say what? Cush, you have Nimrod seed. We're going to cover him later. Mizraim, Egypt, Revelation 11, talks about the Antichrist city being called Egypt. Foot, bow, the first horseman that comes out, the Antichrist, has a bow. And what? Canaan. And Canaan, obviously he needs no introduction. Uh, Canaan, the Canaanite, is where it was the enemy of Israel throughout all that time. He is mentioned, Dr. Upman says, he is mentioned more than 150 times. More than 150 times in the Bible, Canaan. His descendants are the Sodomites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites. Now that's very interesting when we cover Sodom and Gomorrah. All right? Sodom learned its, uh, what term should I call it so I don't get banned on the internet? All right? on its practices, its acceptable practices for today's uh, vomiting society, let's call it, okay? So it's, <laughs> so its practices, the Sodomites, all right, the inhabitants of Sodom, they learned it from Canaan. 
And remember, Noah pronounced a curse upon particularly Canaan. Why? Because Ham did something similar. Remember that? Mm, interesting. They learned it from somebody. Remember this, parents. Children would learn a lot from you. Even stuff that you thought you hid from your children, you'd be surprised that they know about it and they'll follow in your footsteps. Let that be a lesson. All right, let's go back over here. Uh, and the sons of Cush. Now we covered the sons of Cush. Seba, all right, identifies Nubia on the north of Ethiopia in Africa. That's based off of Josephus' writings. Okay, uh, I didn't write all their names here, so let me write it quickly here. All right, maybe y'all can help me on this one. After Cush, well, I have it here. Uh, Mizraim, right? Mizraim. And then foot, all right. Next one is uh, Canaan. And then we cover uh, Cush's uh, children, Seba. All right, so let's go over here. All right, uh, Seba means absorbing. It means to absorb. It means to absorb. That's what Seba means. Havilah. All right, Havilah is a very interesting passage right here. Havilah is, uh, according to Kyle, Lang, and Murphy, is an African tribe and referring to uh, the Avalite, the African tribe called the Avalite, who crossed the Red Sea and beget descendants in Arabia. So believe it or not, Havilah is also another reference to Shem. In Genesis chapter 10, verse 29 through 30, if you look at that one, Genesis chapter 10, verse 29 through 30, you'll notice that Havilah is also mentioned right here. So with Havilah, uh, there could be something interesting here. It could be a reference where uh, we see later on uh, throughout the Bible, and I've taught it at uh, Intermediate Discipleship before, where, or maybe I didn't, but it could be a possibility referring to Hagar and then to Ishmael's descendants, uh, referring to the Arabian region. But then you'll, uh, it, there are two names here, so it could be two things. It could be that Shem and Ham intermingled. Because remember, during the BCs before Abraham, even though they were spreading out and dividing in their lands, they can't help but what? Intermingle. So that's what could have happened. That's the reason why God raised up Abraham. You see that? Because even though God separated and divided it, humanity wants to build cities. Build together. They always want to unite. So then there was intermingling going on before Abraham's day, and idolatry was rampant, obviously. So then God, what did he have to do? He had to get a segregated group of people called Jews. And boy, you talk about segregation right there. He says... You can't marry outside of your own ethnicity. Why? Because he saw what they were doing at Genesis 10. See that? Even though they were dividing, spreading out, they couldn't help but intermingle. So you'll notice some intermingle references and hints throughout Genesis 10. It could also be referring to two different children, you know, one from Ham and the one from Shem. And then it could be two different regions. That might be a possibility. So who knows? Who knows? But then again, uh, it's something interesting. If uh, they did intermingle, then somehow Cush's children may have intermingled with uh, Shem's children, the one who gave birth to Havilah, and that some of their descendants or mothers could have intermingled somewhere. That's why they may have shared the same name, maybe Havilah. So who knows? All right, uh, so we see Havilah, and then the other one is Sapta. 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 And obviously you can't read that, so it's gone. It's referring to the Ethiopians of Arabia, based off of Josephus and Jesenius. Now we come to Ra'ama. 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 
the word means trembling. It means trembling. Uh, according to most commentators, uh, it's referring to the Arabians on the southeast end of Arabia by the Persian Gulf. So these could be the Arabians in Arabia. And then Havilah could have uh, ended up in that region somehow and intermingled with them. This is also based off of Rosenmuller, Noble, Lang, and Kyle, where he got his sources from. The other one is uh, Rama and Saptika. 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 Now, Saptika, let's see here. He is on the east coast of Arabia near uh, Rama's descendants, okay? So he's on the east side. Now, the sons of Rama, we come to over here now, the sons of Rama. Sheba and Dedan. All right, so there are two people mentioned, Sheba and Dedan. Now, Sheba is uh, pretty obvious here. We, you've heard of the reference, the Queen of Sheba, right? So this is referring to uh, one of Ham's descendants where she visited uh, King Solomon. This was found at the Book of Kings, obviously. Now, Sheba means oath. It also means, interestingly, seven. So that is very interesting. Oath or seven. Even better is Song of Solomon, where... Uh, you notice that Song of Solomon uh, boasted about this bride, and the bride is actually a black woman, a black woman. And then I gave a teaching on that, which surprisingly had <laughs> hundreds of thousands of views over there. But uh, it's, uh, uh, the black uh, woman is a great type of the church, actually. The church is typified through that one. All right, and then Jesus, act uh, Jesus as a typology with Solomon. Dedan, okay. Dedan is the next one. It's on the Persian Gulf. On the Persian Gulf. Uh, Sheba is the principal city of Arabia, for some of you who didn't know. It was a principal city in Arabia. Dr. Upman simply writes, uh, Dedan is on the Persian Gulf. He writes two references here. Isaiah 21, 13, Isaiah 21, 13, and Ezekiel 25, 13, Ezekiel 25, 13. Here we go, the interesting part, verse 8, and Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth, and we shall close it off right here and cover this very interesting character, next chance to study, I know. We had to just end it right there. Okay, let's close it with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that today's teachings were a blessing to the hearers, made us more aware of our, uh, our roots, about our genealogy, and also the way that you are, and not only that, the history of human nature, most importantly, and how God deals with human nature. That's what dispensation, uh, dispensationalism is based on. It's God's dealing with, on man throughout the ages. And I pray that we'll have a better understanding of it so that we don't repeat their mistakes, so that we can predict where human nature will go toward and how your dealings work so that we can follow on what's right in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.